Hey everybody. Well, today I want to talk about jazz is legato music. And yeah, that sounds a little self-explanatory, but trust me, for the adult amateur players out there playing any instrument, not just saxophone, this is colossally important and not just amateur players. Stick with me on this one. Now, of the hundred or more videos that I've done already, I honestly think this may be the most important one, the one that can take your playing from where it is today to an entirely different level in a handful of weeks. Triad pairs are interesting and bebop scales are cool and tritone subs and whatever else, but that is not nearly as important as what we're gonna talk about here. Jazz is legato music. Okay, so let's dig into this. So I first um, heard that sentence, I think that exact sentence, from a friend and mentor of mine, Ed Sof. Ed was the drum set professor at the University of North Texas when I was there, one of the great jazz drum educators of all time and one of the great drummers of all time. Ed was fantastic. And uh, we ended up playing professionally together, which was truly fantastic. I remember going to a drum workshop at North Texas and I wasn't even a drummer at the time. But um, I just loved learning about the other instruments and their roles and how they fit into the group. I felt like that made me a better musician. So um, Ed was standing in front of a room of you know probably 200 drummers and he was saying jazz is legato music. The drum set is a legato instrument. And immediately I'm thinking, what is he talking about? It's staccato, it's marcato. Like where's there a legato sound in a snare drum? You know, I was confused at the time, right? And so he was pointing out that in jazz, we're talking about jazz here, where is the time? Where is the feel kept on the drum set in jazz? Well, it's the ride cymbal. Dang, 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 dang. Notice how I'm singing it. I'm not going ding, 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 ding. A jazz ride cymbal has sustain to it. Interesting, right? And some drummers go so far as to drill holes in their cymbal and put rivets in the cymbal so that the cymbal has more sustain, more sizzle. Hmm, interesting. Now, if the drummer chooses to not be on the ride cymbal, where else might they play time in jazz? Well, over on the hi-hat. But it's not ding, ding, da, ding, ding, da, ding. Closed hi-hat, it's a partially open hi-hat that then opens further. They play the hi-hat, in, the, in, in a way that makes it have more sustain, more legato. Hmm, interesting. Now, if the drummer isn't on the ride cymbal or the hi-hat, what could they be doing? Well, in jazz, brushes. Brushes on the snare drum. That is an incredibly legato sound. So Ed was talking about how you have to develop your hands, you have to develop these rhythms to give this legato sound on the drums. It was fascinating. And, and I remember it really changing things for this room full of fantastic drummers at the University of North Texas. Think about the jazz bass, those walking quarter notes. Ding, 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 that kind of sound, right? It's not din, 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 din. That's not swinging. It's not swinging. So, okay, I think I've made my point. We have to learn how to play legato. So we connect our notes. That is literally, by the way, what legato means. Connect the notes. If you play a C and you're going to a D, connect them. Here's the thing, that is the most difficult thing in the world to do on almost all these instruments, to play something like this. That is incredibly hard. Now, <clears throat> to make my point a little further, I was uh, up in Minneapolis a couple months ago hanging out with a friend of mine who was doing major orchestral auditions. He's a wind player. I won't tell you what instrument or his name or anything like that to protect the innocent, but um, he's auditioning for major orchestras around this country for the principal chair. So this dude is, he's up there. And so he's studying with people about what it takes to be a principal player in one of the best orchestras in the country. Guess what he's been working on exclusively? Playing C, to D, because the instrument hates that. All these instruments. On the piano, you have to release a key and press a key at precisely the right time. Release a string and press a string. On a trumpet, the valves, like the length of the trumpet, the length of the trombone is literally changing. That's what happens here. So it is impossibly hard to play two notes that are connected. 
And if you think like, what the hell is he talking about? I can do that just fine. That's a sign you can't do it just fine. So there's just that basic part of playing the instrument. And the real pros out there are shaking their head like, yeah, man. <laughs> yes, I have spent hundreds of hours on that ability to connect notes, to connect a line. Now, we're going to talk about it in the context of jazz. I have a really good PDF here for you. I wrote out an etude over a course of blues, and I have it transposed into all four keys, you know, alto sax, tenor sax, trumpets, bass clef, all that kind of stuff. And so if you want this PDF or any of the PDFs for the Digging Deeper series, please send me an email and I will send it off to you. Right? You probably figured out where, you know, what some of the source was for this. And the reason I kept the rhythms from a famous jazz tune and a little bit of the shapes is uh, how challenging that is. Now, when I hear, um, I, I work through jazzwire.net, by the way, I hope you join us there. Um, I work through jazzwire.net at the summer jazz camp that I've run for 15 years, Maryland Summer Jazz. And in all these situations, I've worked with thousands, literally thousands of adult students. And of course, plenty of students at the university I used to teach at and everything else. So I've heard this numerous times from most people. It's rare that somebody comes in not making this mistake. You may be the, one of those, it's probably like 10%. Nine out of 10 people have this issue as I had this issue. So nine out of 10 of you or more are gonna have this issue. So. Let's look at this uh, sheet, and let me just play the very first phrase for you. Now, I put slurs all the way through this thing to literally, by the way, slurs are those big, long, curvy lines over top, and they tell you that there is no break in the sound, no break in your air, no break between any of the notes under a slur. So now we don't usually see slurs in jazz because it's presumed you know that jazz is legato music, right? So there's the presumption. Most jazz will have slurs over top of it if we were gonna go to the trouble of putting them in. Now in that first line, um, there were two sideways accents. And those are accents where we hit the note a little harder. And then the very last note at the end of the slur is a housetop accent, staccato. So now I'm gonna play it one more time for you and listen for the two accents under the slur as well as the staccato or short ending. <laughs> Now, that's where things get tricky, is when we start moving our airstream as a horn player, where we start messing around with the volume, with our hands on any of these other instruments we're playing, we tend to introduce little weird articulations that shouldn't be there. It is so hard to play that long slur line with accents, with volume movements inside the line, under the slur, but still not breaking the chain. So the, the, the image somebody gave me years ago was like pearls on a pearl necklace. They're absolutely connected, but each note is this individual perfect thing on its own, yet it's connected to the other. That's what we're trying to go for. So now here's what I hear a lot of time is those accents sitting on their side, people will have a sense that that's what they're supposed to do, accent that note, or they see it written there, oh, I'm supposed to accent that note, and they'll make it short. It'll sound like this. I hear that a lot. Was that swinging? Not as much as the first way. The, those interruptions, it made it sound ricky-ticky or old-fashioned or dumb, right? <laughs> However you want to put it. Here's one that I hear, this used to really confuse me as a younger teacher, and yes, I have been younger, like yesterday. Um, as a younger teacher, this would confuse me, is people would play the note 
before an accented note short. So here's the accented note, but they play this one short. It would sound like this. I have heard that so many times. And so I think what it is, is people are aware, here's the accent, and they're getting ready for the accent and their body does this little thing. There's this little sort of flinch involved. Um, so yeah, that is the hardest thing, how to play up to an accent without breaking the stream. It is, I don't need to say it any more times, how difficult that is. Let me play it the last time for you, nice and legato. <laughs> Okay, so I hope you're hearing a really, really big difference there, right? And I wanna give you probably the most important practice tool here. Now, if you've watched these videos, you know that, yes, I like presenting interesting information. I like presenting actionable information, stuff that's actually gonna make you sound noticeably better, perform noticeably better, but the most, most important thing is how do you practice it? Those first two things are not that hard. Here's something that's interesting, and if you get good at it, you'll sound good. That's not teaching, right? Teaching is the part where, and here's how to practice it. And good teaching is the part where, well, here's how to practice it efficiently and quickly, okay? So that's what's coming up in just a second. But I just wanna break right there. I, I just wanna say, I'm, I have such a blast doing these Digging Deeper videos, and I wanna ask you all a favor. Uh, the reason I continue doing these videos for free, you know, hundreds of videos in now, is uh, the feedback I get. There's, I, I, I just hear from 100 people a week often um, asking great questions and things like that, but especially just letting me know this works for them. So what I wanna ask for you, if you're enjoying these videos, share them with a couple people. Share them with musicians you know, mention them to somebody at a jam session. If you're a teacher or if you're a student, mention it to your students, mention them to your teachers. I wanna share this stuff with more people. And it's working, so let's get this out there. So I just really appreciate it. If you're enjoying this, I guarantee somebody you know is gonna enjoy it too. Put it on Instagram, put it on Facebook, whatever it is, I would appreciate that. All right, let's get back to it. So now here's one of the most important practice things. Uh, and let me tell you a heart-wrenching story. You may wanna get a box of tissue or like lay down because it's one of those kind of stories that may take it out of you emotionally. When I got to North Texas, I was 21. I had gone to college in Canada, took a year off to work in a factory to make money to go to this school in the United States. I get there, I get to my first lesson and here's the thing, and I was, pretty good player by that point. I've been playing professionally in Canada for three years and jazz gigs and re recording or two. So I get to North Texas and um, for the whole first semester, 13 weeks, the, in, in the jazz reading part of my lessons, we never made it off the first line of page one of the book I was playing out of. We literally never made it past the fourth measure. And so I was getting quite depressed, like what? How is this gonna work where I'm taking a semester to learn four measures? I was really confused and really uh, depressed about it. Uh, and then it occurred to me that all of everything I needed to know about all of jazz and articulation and reading and rhythm and feel was in those first four measures. I didn't need to look at 10,000 more pitches and notes. Everything was there. So when I really focused in my practice, when my teacher focused everything there, I got so that I knew those first, those four measures better than I'd known anything in my life, like the back of my hand, that was interesting. So did you notice when I was playing before and giving you examples of good articulation, bad articulation, not even articulation, but legato, right? I played the first phrase. That is how you're supposed to practice. So yes, I wrote out a 12 measure etude. I could have made it 36 or 48 measures too. I can do that, not very hard, but I didn't, I made it 12. And in the example, I played that one phrase. So when you're practicing it, sure, you may wanna practice all 12 measures and learn the pitches and see if there's any cool licks you wanna steal, please do that. 
But if you're practicing this legato thing, do not get past measure two for a good long time. I'm not saying you have to take 13 weeks, but do it over and over. Do it incredibly slowly because you're going you're gonna to be making mistakes that you're not hearing. This is why doctors don't treat themselves. They can't look at themselves obje objectively. Therapists can't treat their family or themselves, right? We know this to be true. So most of you can't give yourself a lesson. It doesn't work that way. You can't objectively hear what you're doing. Or what you're hearing may not be at the level of a really, really good teacher, right? So that's what we do at jazzwire.net. By the way, please, I want to see you over there. And until May 1st, so it's coming up, May 1st, 2019, 50% off registration. So use the code digging spring to get to Jazzwire, where we can do this, like you and I, you and a hundred other people at Jazzwire can have this conversation, listening and giving you feedback right away. So concept, jazz is legato. I think I convinced you of that early on. Listen to any of your favorite players. Of course, there are short notes, right? But human speech, in English anyway, is legato. All these words are connecting. And sure, every once in a while, I'll go, hey, okay, that was a marcato statement, a staccato statement, right? But so we understand it's legato, cool. Now we understand how to practice it. It can be this etude or any transcription jazz etude. It could be anything, okay? We understand why it's important. We understand what it is, but here's the how part. This is how to practice it. And I'm suggesting most of you won't be able to pull this off on your own. I was pretty talented young player and everything, and I was playing wrong. I was listening to jazz, famous great jazz, and then I showed up at North Texas as a pro player, 21 years old, and they're like, dude, that ain't it. How did I miss that? And all the teachers I had in Canada. There it is, right? So I'm suggesting get some help with this stuff. But the bottom line is if you know what and why, that is colossal. You know the idea, right? And now you know how to practice a little bit, and uh, it's going to get better. It is going to get better. And uh, I'd love to see you at jazzwire.net. This is the kind of thing we've been working on with lots of folks there. And people have transformed their playing from Ricky Ticky literally unswinging to, wow, man, that was swinging. I mean, that sounded like, you know, some real jazz right there. This is happening in a month or two. So I would love to see you there. Thank you so much. Hope you enjoyed this. And like I said, share this video or one of your favorites from previous. I want to spread the word. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great week.